Hey everybody, it's been forever since I shot a video. Now of course it wouldn't be a video for me unless there was some terrible problem that I couldn't fix in post. In this case, the air conditioner upstairs is sitting right above where the camera is mounted to the ceiling in my office, uh, which imposed a sine wave distortion across the video that I was only barely able to remove using the stabilizer plugin in Premiere. Hopefully this video won't be terribly nauseating, but the quality is a little lower than it should be as a result. Please bear with me this time, and next time I'll check before I begin recording. Um, it's been even longer since I uploaded one, but it sure as shit been a long time since I shot one. So that's because I've been sad, and the world is hard, and also because I decided my camera sucks. So it's really hard to keep working when you got, you know, a lot of things working against you, it feels like. This is a video scan converter. As you can see, it's the Center Stage CS1, and I'm not here to demo it because it's way too much effort. Uh, for me to demo this, I'd have to demo it against my OSSC, which is currently hooked up elsewhere in the house, and uh, I'd have to get stuff out to plug into it. Nah, 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 nah. I don't feel like it. So for those of you who saw this and immediately thought, oh, great, we're going to see some great pixel peeps. We're, we're, we're going to get to see 240Ps. Nah, I'm sorry, that's not this video. Maybe a later one. Maybe if I have more energy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, this device here takes a video signal of one particular format and converts it into another particular format. And in practical terms, it converts it from standard definition up to something not standard definition. However, uh, most scan converters that you encounter in the wild, especially at a thrift store, are usually much simpler ordeals. Uh, for instance, uh, this boy is a, a bit more normal. And uh, this one here was 20 bucks at uh, the RePC, and it takes uh, VGA in, uh, and it spits out uh, DVI, and that's it, and that's all it does. It doesn't take uh, composite video, et cetera. Um, so it doesn't convert from standard definition, it converts from a uh, higher resolution, from a, a, a PC resolution. Uh, you know, typically at least 640 by 480 in most cases. Uh, it takes a lot of different inputs, but what's interesting about it is actually that it makes a lot of different output options available. You see, it outputs DVI, which of course you can ad adapt to HDMI, but you'll notice it has some resolution specified here, 480 and XGA to be specific. Now, uh, I was using this for a long time as my sole input scaler for um, my old PC stuff that I do particularly on my, my streaming channel, but uh, I've done plenty of on this channel as well uh, on this particular device. I used to have a different one, and uh, this one I decided was a little higher quality, certainly for, for what I was doing. And then this one gave up the ghost, um, quit working, and I'm not sure why, and I'm not even sure if I want to fix it or just go invest in, you know, some other better scaler. Uh, so I found this at the store, and I thought, well, maybe this is the hero I need, and for a few reasons I, I don't think that it is, but uh, I still have some questions about it that I'd like to, to see if we can answer tonight. So. Going back to the resolutions, uh, the reason this has uh, two resolutions listed on it, okay, uh, is because this thing can output a lot of different resolutions and frequencies. So uh, the menu on here, there's obviously no screen on it. It's an OSD. Um, now, immediately, someone out there is suspicious. It's a it's a scan converter, but it has an OSD. Well, that's almost certainly going to introduce some latency. Well, it probably did, but I never used this for playing on an HDMI monitor, you know, with uh, action games. All I was doing was using it to capture, for which, you know, who gives a shit about latency? And I thought it looked fine for what it was. But uh, one of the options in the OSD is to adjust the output resolution to all sorts of things. I think all the way up to 1080i uh, on the output, which is peculiar. Uh, I didn't know you could do interlaced on DVI. Uh, I guess so, so... Uh, but it would go all the way down to 640 by 480. Uh, but it would let you choose 60, 65, 70, 75 hertz, and in some cases, I think 80 and 85. Uh, so, of course, it was very easy to run this thing out of the range that your monitor could support, and I did that frequently when I was messing around with it. Uh, and then, you, because it's a, an OSD, you'd be lost. You wouldn't be able to return to uh, um, a failsafe. So that's why we've got these. Uh, 480p, you press both those buttons at once, and it'll just snap you right back to uh, uh, 640 by 480, presumably. I think that's what that was. And the next GA, uh, don't quote me, that's either 800 by 600, no, I think that's 1024 by 768, but I could be wrong. You hit those, and it snaps you back there. So uh, that's it, and uh, it, you know, it worked okay until it didn't. So 
this guy here, the reason that I mention all this and the reason that this is relevant is because um, when I powered this up at the thrift store, more on that in a moment, uh, I found that the OSD would let me select output resolutions and frequencies as well, and they look exactly the same as what comes out of this. And that's interesting, because I've had this open, and this does not look like an off-the-shelf component. Uh, really kind of surprised at how much went into this thing. Uh, so I'm going to start taking this apart because I'd like to show you what's in it and then we're going to take this apart and see what's in it. And while I'm doing that I'll give you some history. So don't take what I say here as the gospel, okay? Um, there's more to it than this, but I'm going to simplify. Uh, these things are for projectors. That's, that's kind of what they're for. Um, Back in the day, so in the early 2000s in particular, which is when these devices were at their heyday, and I believe, and I'll tell you more about this later, this device here I think is from 03. Um, at that time, the prospect of purchasing a flat screen television uh, was still a pretty outrageous one. They were expensive, um, often low resolution, um, and uh, obviously fragile and whatnot. Uh, so they were outside of the uh, budget of a lot of people who would have liked to have a large image. Why would you need a big picture in 2003 specifically from a computer? Now there's only a couple reasons for that but there's really only just one and it's slideshows. Slideshows that everyone in the room despises and doesn't want anything to do with and wishes that they could die. If you wanted a slideshow prior to the explosion of um, mass-produced inexpensive televisions. So you could stuff one in every conference room. What you needed was a projector. You would often in a corporate environment or when giving a presentation at a seminar or something, uh, a projector was the only way to go. The problem is that projectors were, if you, if you were lucky they took VGA, but most of the time you were just looking at composite or S-video in. And then on the flip side you had uh, what they called data projectors, which were ones that were intended for connection to a computer. Uh, and those ones, in fact, would only take VGA. I've since fact-checked myself, and I cannot find any evidence of the thing I'm talking about, a device that only takes VGA and nothing else. It seems like they all took composite video. So chalk that up to me misremembering the 2000s. Both these devices were likely made for talking to projectors, like almost certainly. Uh, you'd take your input from, you know, a television uh, and spit it out to uh, a projector, uh, or you'd take your, your input from a a PC here uh, or here and spit it out to uh, interlaced, you know, composite baseband video for going into whatever you had. You know, I'm sorry, uh, I actually, I'm a dipshit. Um, this one only takes input at composite or uh, high res and converts up to high res uh, for, for output. I'm, I was lying through my teeth. Uh, I thought because of the, the two different inputs, I thought I had read one of them as an in. Um, and one of them is an out, but that's not true. So this is all just inputs. So this one does not convert down to a standard def. Um, but certainly that, that was available. I've got two of those in a box in my closet. But uh, this one was, was just for converting uh, baseband video uh, up to use with a, a data projector. Um, I would also guess, and again, I'll have to look at the manual to confirm this, but I, I would also guess that this took uh, high computer resolutions um, and then converted them down because uh, if you had a 640x480 only projector, you might want to take 1024x768 video and just squash it down and shove it into the projector, and it won't look great, but it makes it way easier to run the presenter's computer, uh, among other things. All right, so with that said, here's what we got. So answers are not super forthcoming on, of course, this mystery. You can tell from its position and from all the traces going into it that it's almost certainly... Uh, the core of the beast. Um, I haven't googled these things yet. I can make some guesses, but I'd guess that's RAM, probably. Uh, this guy here, since it sits pretty clearly in front of the DVI port, I'd say that's your DVI interface. You know, it looks like they, they might actually have the analog pins on the DVI hooked up. Yeah, I think they do. So this thing might, yeah, I, R, G, and B. Um, I never tested, but this thing, I think, probably outputs the analog. Uh, and then this guy here sits directly in front of the buttons, so that's probably an MCU, uh, a microcontroller. Um, so this guy programs this guy. And this, that's the big question, right? What, what are you? 
No, that's that's glued on. There's no way that heat sink's coming off. Unless I declare this thing completely EOL, like if I decide this thing's totally fucked, um, then I can pop that off. But frankly, it's probably gonna rip off the top of the die with it. Or not the die, but the you know the epoxy package. It's probably gonna rip off the lettering. We're not gonna learn anything from that, I suspect. Uh, I can almost promise you this is some sort of either custom chip or an ASIC um, that's a scaler. Because again, this thing is from like 03, 04, something like that. Um, and they would have been dependent on pretty expensive pieces of hardware to do the sort of stuff that this does. So yes, unsurprisingly, yeah, this, this guy up here, the Sync Moss, uh, that's an 8051 based microcontroller. So yep, that's exactly what I thought it was. So that's gonna be the, the brains of the operation. That just keeps track of what's going on. Uh, this boy here, the wind bond, that is an EEPROM, so that stores the settings for this. This guy here is an LVDS receiver, that's uh, DVI HDMI signaling, so just as we expected. You got SDRAM, 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 and then, yep, this guy up here is a, it's an ADC, it's an RGB graphics digitizer for SXGA. Uh, yep, so there you go. So, theory of operation, right? RGB video from the VGA comes in here, gets digitized by this into a, a stream of bits, goes in here. Uh, this guy is a probably an ASIC, I would guess. Uh, and I say that because if this were a microprocessor, then they wouldn't have this guy. Because the only thing this is doing is taking input from three I.O. lines um, and then storing like five bits of data in this, uh, this EEPROM. I don't think that they would have bothered with these two very expensive uh, relatively speaking, extra pieces of gear and a, uh, an extra crystal to clock them and so on. I don't think they would have bothered with these if this was a state machine. I think this thing is dumb uh, silicon. I, I think that what happens most likely is that this, this guy here produces a clock pulse. Um, the VGA has a sync pulse and the sync, when it comes in here, causes a sync to come out here. This guy then starts latching data. Um, it latches at exactly the speed that this crystal sets uh, these two devices to, to speak at. Um, or maybe this device has some sort of PLL or something to, to monitor the input sync here. And as this thing clocks out bits, this guy here is just taking them and slamming them into SDRAM. Um, so it packs up the, the first uh, SDRAM here with the, the current frame. When it gets to the end of the frame, this guy in silicon, not in logical procedural steps, you know, uh, load this register, load that register, uh, branch if this larger than that, not that sort of thing, but in, in raw, just dumb digital logic, uh, takes the bits that are in this SDRAM uh, and smushes or expands them in order to fit into the expected output signal uh, and then packs up these SDRAMs with that. Uh, and then I would guess uh, this has I.O. lines connecting it to the LVDS transceiver. Um, and, and then it just reads out the images that it generated uh, and spits them out the LVDS. And then the uh, output characteristics of that image are programmed uh, by what the microcontroller uh, sends to this thing on, on some I.O. lines. So in other words, uh, a tremendous amount of equipment to achieve what this is doing. Um, nowadays, I'm pretty sure this would be one chip and then one chip. But it's doing the same con same, same concept, uh, same idea. Um, the ones they have now, I don't know if they'd be purpose-built silicon or if they'd be some sort of uh, sort of a microprocessor with a, a program just burnt into mask ROM. Um, but the concept is the same, regardless of how they execute it. It's still digitally uh, taking a signal and squishing or expanding it and then spitting it out the, the output here. I do want to make absolutely clear that's total horse shit. I speculated all that. I have no way to prove it. Just based on the stuff that's there, based on the, the parts, the Legos that make this thing up, uh, that is my guess about how it works. Um, but I'd be surprised if I was wrong. Looks like this has a U chassis. So we're gonna need to take out these screws and the screws on the side and this whole thing should come off. Now I can assure you this will be more sophisticated than the other one. There's gonna be a lot more going on in here. Alternately, this is gonna be one big motherfucker FPGA and not a whole lot else other than just 
fiberglass and copper to get it all wired together. But I'll bet you anything, given the age of this thing, it's probably not an FPGA. It's pr Nowadays it might be an FPGA, something this big. Because an FPGA can be reconfigured to do anything on the planet these days, given the appropriate price point. But uh, at this time, I think this would be individual components selected to do a specific job and then a microprocessor at the center of it orchestrating everything much as we saw in the previous one. I'll, I'll bet these devices are in the functional block diagram probably just about identical. The question is not are they functionally identical. That's not the question I'm asking. The actual question is are they identical? The reason I say this is a trend throughout the history of electronics is that rare things, things that not very many people need, tend to be very non-diverse in the market. The whole you know, capitalism creates competition, creates diff, da 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 da, da. no. Uh, none of that applies to electronics. Um, it hardly applies to anything else, but sure shit doesn't apply to electronics. The way electronics work is that um, a handful of Chinese companies, or maybe just one, makes a jelly bean part um, that everyone then purchases and puts in a billion different devices. And so what'll happen is if you go back to 2003 and you buy 10 serial ATA cards, uh, you'll find that every single one of them is the same SIG chip. They're all made by SIIG and they all had the same bus bug where they would sometimes corrupt the data being written to your hard drive. Unless you bought one from Adaptech, Threeware, um, I don't even know if there's anybody else. I mean, the ProGrade stuff, the Dell PowerEdge stuff, that was okay, but if you bought any others, you were just buying the same card with a, a different PCB under it. The problem was there wasn't enough demand for someone to bother making a second completely new design, and so there was just one company making them. So with something like this, it's even worse because if you had, I don't know, a couple thousand sales a year, you know, that's not enough to spur the development of a completely new application-specific IC um, just to do one purpose, you know. So if if one company made a scaler, you can for damn sure bet that scaler was in everything. Whoa. Well. Well. Hmm. Well, I think I look like a doofus. Eh, well, who knows? Who knows? Let's talk. So obviously, this boy here is the heart of the entire operation. Uh, there's a lot going on around it, but let's look this one up. I found something. Here is a review from LA Audio File. That's odd. Silicon Image iScan Ultra Line Doubler. 2003, I'll bet. Uh, 2002, yeah. And what do we have? So this person's talking about a uh, 3-2 pull-down um, there was a thing called the eye scan from Silicon Image that used the advantage of low cost ASIC technology. Yeah, low cost, okay. So this chip got used in the eye scan Ultra, apparently. The, the SIL 504 is what they're calling it. So apparently that's just ostensibly a de interlacer. Hmm. All right, and this one says the input video interfaces to the same Philips SAA 7118E multi-standard video decoder uh, with a built-in comb filter. Um, digital progressive video is sent to a Xilinx Spartan FPGA, and I'm already, <laughs> I'm seeing some things. It says the Philips SAA 7118. Is that the Philips logo? Can just barely make it out, but it is there. That's definitely the 7118. Let me wipe that off. Yes, 7118E. That's it. What's that? But is I like Spartan? So, you see, this is the thing that I said. Um, despite the fact that this thing is not branded, uh, the Silicon Image Eyeline Ultra, um, this is, or sorry, Eye Scan Ultra. It's clearly a Silicon Image iScan Ultra. It's the same thing. It's got the same parts. This plugs into that, plugs into that, and that's most of the equipment there, right? The rest of this stuff, you know, we'll look at it, but it's fairly immaterial. 
So chances are that if you bought this and an iScan Ultra, uh, you would not be able to find any difference between them, um, except for maybe the specific inputs and outputs. Uh, it also looks... See, I'm looking at the eye scan here, and I see that the screen on it would appear to be would appear to be a seven segment display, and those aren't fun to work with, and the buttons don't look super pleasant either. Uh, this one, on the other hand, has you know a menu interface and a whole bunch of, of uh, nice uh, pressable backlit buttons on it. So I think what this company is selling essentially uh, is a menu interface. You know, it's, it's a better interface for the same device, right? The Silicon Image um, iScan was the reference standard uh, design, um, just something to put their new chip that they developed in. And then this guy uh, is someone else's you know, OEM variant that uh, takes it to another level. So that stands to reason. Now, what are you? Genesis, is that GM5020? Yeah, H. For its position, I'm guessing that is the, the that's the DVI input. So that's going to be an L, uh, LVDS interface as well. So this is a all-in-one image processor for displays with a analog and digital interface supporting resolutions up to SXGA, and that is a scaler, apparently, as well. So that's interesting. So the SA7118 down here must do the scaling. This is interesting. So this guy here is a input converter and scaler. This this does uh, zoom and shrink from VGA to SXGA and frame rate conversion. So unless they've turned off all that stuff, then what comes out of this is a finished product. The silicon image chip is not the thing that's doing the uh, uh, processing on that. This is the actual scaler. In, in the DVI portion of this product. If you're using the DVI interface, this is the only thing that's really in play, I suspect. So this guy, you would think, if this is a deinterlacer, this is not an interlace signal. So presumably, this guy is only used for the composite, yeah, the composite video inputs. Oh, and I'm sorry, and this guy uh, here also does VGA, um, and the VGA port is up here. So. That tells us that uh, this thing is the entire device, this, this Genesis unit. This is the scaler if you're using any of the computer resolutions. Um, so just everything on this side of the machine uh, would seem to be relevant only to the, uh, the VGA DVI stuff. And then uh, all the composite low resolution video stuff is, is everything down here. I'm super curious what all these are, but of course there's nothing, no manual that'll ever tell me. Um, but just from the shape, that's more RAM. RAM up here. RAM, RAM, RAM. So this uh, FPGA here, that guy apparently does aspect ratio conversion and chroma filtering. And then the output of that goes to an analog devices ADV7301 chip uh, for the DAX for the video output and to the SIL panel link. Okay, that guy right there produces the DVI output. Where on earth is the... Oh, well, I guess maybe this one uses a different uh, a different converter for the VGA. Well, that's funny, actually. I wonder where that is. Oh, nope, there it is. ADV7132. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so they used a different uh, analog devices chip uh, for the VGA output. All right, so now we have the, the functional diagram, pretty much. So the only other mysteries on here, are really... Um, this is an FPGA, that's an FPGA, no telling what those do. And then this Philips gadget up here, the length of that name, I think that might be, uh, that might be a, a microcontroller. Yeah, and then this, this guy is the microcontroller. So the one open question I have at this point is uh, what switches the inputs? Because from um, S-Video to uh, component to composite, oh, and that has progressive input as well. I had noticed that, but it actually does a, uh, RGB and YPBPR uh, at Progressive. And it's interesting, actually, I'm going to make a speculation about this, uh, but if I go back and check the specs on the iScan, I'll find that it doesn't do Progressive input. Reason being, um, if this is based around these, these parts, I'm sorry, these parts, then I would think if this thing here, which is doing the uh, conversion for the interlaced video, um, if it could take 
progress a video, then it would just take it over, over the same jacks. The fact they have separate ones suggests to me that they had to use something else. Um, that could be this Galaxy apart. No, it's probably this Xilinx here. And of course, it's an FPGA. Everything from Xilinx pretty much is. So we don't know. We can't prove that. So let's start with this. Standard component interlaced and composite interlaced goes into the Philips interlaced video converter. From there, it goes to the silicon image to be deinterlaced. I believe at this point the Philips has done the scaling already. The S video input might go through a different interface, but I think it probably goes in here as well. I think that this here, this Xilinx, handles the progressive video just because its physical position is, is right here. Um, and you can see that all this clearly provides a, you know, a path through to, to that guy there. I don't know what happens exactly at this point. The video has to make its way probably to these RAM chips in order to be processed by the Spartan, uh, which performs the aspect ratio and color conversion. Um, then the Spartan talks to the silicon image and the ADV to output the digital analog video. So that's all pretty straightforward. And of course the Genesis handles the DVI input. We know the Philips is probably the calling all the shots, directing everything. My big question is how does the switching happen? If we've got all these inputs and they all come down to the Spartan most likely, um, could there possibly be enough lines on there that all these things feed into it directly and it has to feed everything into RAM and then back out or do multiple things have access to RAM? Um, the fact that there's a RAM chip over here makes me pause. I wonder who that belongs to. It seems to me like it goes straight into the silicon image. So maybe the silicon image just needs RAM to do its deinterlacing work, so that stands to reason. I would say that this thing is uh, pretty much the exact same thing that silicon image released as the reference design in 2002. Uh, this one was just released with a couple uh, enhancements on the inputs and uh, a much better user interface. And uh, I've taken a look and confirmed that on the original iScan, uh, we've got composite S-video um, and then component, which is not labeled as progressive or interlaced, so we have to presume it is interlaced, and that's it. Um, and then in, it does not have a VGA input. That is just a pass-through. Um, and that would be because um, you'd want to be able to hook this up in a signal chain so you could run your, your PC through it. Um, so this thing would just uh, uh, strip off the signal for projection and it would continue through to an ordinary monitor uh, and probably likewise for the DVI. So yes, um, it looks like uh, yeah, these focus folks uh, actually did bring something to the table. Um, they added a number of components to this through what appears to be quite a bit of extra effort. Um, to make this thing really, uh, really high class. Like this, in 2003, this would have been just a beast, a real monster. Um, this thing would take anything, convert to anything um, at the time. And uh, it looks like they really, uh, they really kind of outdid themselves. This all looks like fantastic stuff. Um, as with the other device, obviously you can, you know, it's buffering it in the conversion. Um, there's going to be some latency there. And at the time they would not have cared about that. Um, and Daria, my girlfriend, has confirmed that this thing does have unacceptable latency for video game purposes. So, um, like I said, I'm not going to test it, but uh, you can probably just take my word for it. This is not going to replace your Frame Meister. Uh, I like the design. This is that good, solid 90s design, you know? Ribbon cables, so you can take the board out without having to pop, pop the jacks off. Um, everything's nice and modular. Big, fat disconnect here, so you can pull this guy off and test all the rails. Uh, no complaints about uh, how it's designed. Now, one thing I should note while I'm in here, uh, I'm looking around because this thing has a problem where every time I start it up, it takes like four, five, six tries before it uh, properly starts up. And I was hoping I'd find a yeah, loose component, uh, something that looked burnt. I, I, it looks fine to me. So that's part of the reason I wanted this open was to see if there's anything clearly broken, but there's, there's nothing broken. So I don't know why it's doing it, but it seems like if I, I turn it on, uh, and the screen will just fritz out. Now if I just let it sit for a bit and then power cycle it, it seems to start working. So this video was uh, was not entirely about this device. I'm just gonna put a couple screws in it to keep it from completely going to pieces. And then we're gonna look at some other things. Um, I don't really have it, you know, the energy to do a whole video, if you will, right now on one subject. 
Um, so I just wanted to get something out. So I just want to show you a couple other things I've got. Now I'll point out, I forgot to actually cover the thing that I said I was covering when I opened this up. Are these two devices the same device under the hood? The answer, as far as I'm concerned, is clearly not. Apparently there were options at the time for different chips for the same purpose. I'll be uploading a part two of this video with a lot of other things in it very soon. This one ran a lot longer than intended, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, it'll have a lot more exciting things than this one did.